So this week I wanted to talk about Buddhist literature, Smashing Delusion, as is what I titled it. And just so that you know, sometimes you give titles that sound much more dramatic than the, than the presentation is probably going to be. You know, it's, it's like telling the book by its cover. So, the, you know, this has a sexier cover than topic, but there it is. Um, and I wanted to talk about Buddhism as, as literature because I think that we have a, um, I won't say misplaced view of Buddhist literature, but we, we treat it in a particular fashion that doesn't represent what it really is. Uh, I guess that's the best way to place it. And of course, everyone here probably knows that Buddhism was initially an oral tradition uh, for the first several hundreds of years of Buddhist existence. And the Pali Triptaka consists of the Vinaya Triptaka, which is the code of discipline, and the Sutta Pitaka, which is the discourses of Shakyamuni Buddha, and then the Abhidharma, which are, uh, is a scholastic representation of <coughs> not really summarizing, but I guess expanding upon what the sutra were discussing. And <coughs> it began to be put into a written form around the time of Ashoka, which would have been about 250 BCE, but it wasn't fully committed to text until about the first century BCE. And the Sanskrit literature, by contrast, there are two major collections. One collection is the Chinese collection, and the other collection is the Tibetan collection. And when I talk about the Chinese collection, probably the most thorough collection that we see today is actually the Taisho collection, which is in Japan, in which the um, during that period of time, the Japanese collected all of the Chinese materials and put it into one, into one collection. And the Mahayana canon is, is delineated by Sutra and Vinaya, as is the, the Pali canon. But rather than an Abhidharma, it really comes down to Shastra or commentary. And the commentary, and, and I'll... Have to, I have to say that the commentary is everything from really learned materials by people like, or groups like people like uh, Nagarjuna, um, to Chigi, to Hua Yen teachers, etc. And also to be aware that the Mahayana canon, the Sanskrit, what is considered a sutra is a little bit more... Um, free form contrasted to what is a sutra in the Theravada traditions. Um, but the, so that really constitutes uh, Buddhist literature. Now I'm not talking about more recent Buddhist literature in which you have, um, you know, various books that are intended, you know, like Buddhism for idiots and things like that. I'm not really discussing, you know, that kind of popular literature. I'm discussing more the literature that, that is quote unquote serious. But there is some there is some bleed over. I mean, if you look at um, let's say uh, Ziprin's uh, take on Tiantai teachings, that is probably something that will be incorporated within Buddhist literature for many decades to come. Unfortunately, Buddhist Buddhism for idiots probably will also be incorporated in that, but that's a different issue. Um, one of the points I wanted to make is that when we study, that studying Buddhist literature is a different process compared to studying to obtain knowledge, which is what you might do with a textbook, or being entertained reading a novel, or other reasons for delving into secular literature, you know, handbooks, you know, how to put together your, your, uh, the cabinet that you bought from Ikea, something along those lines. It's a different process. And as one studies and thinks about the sutra or commentary, the person is guided by a new perspective. And this is what I wanted to talk about in terms of smashing delusion. 
much of Buddhist literature is intended not to be descriptive. Some of it is to be analytic. Some of it is to be what we now refer to as critical. But much of it is really intended to provide a different way of looking at the Buddhist teachings. The literature typically does not contain material to be memorized the way one would memorize a, an uh, anatomy textbook by, by example, um, nor are the topics based on collections of data. It's not to say that the data doesn't, is not produced in some Buddhist literature, but in general, it doesn't produce data the way we think of that. Rather, the works are opened are intended to open the mind to a new way of thinking. And I think that's, that's part of what I wanted to get across, is the literature is intended to expand the mind, not to be descriptive, not always to be analytic, um, not to provide data, but to open the mind. <clears throat> and as a result, the materials often Nonlinear. Now, it's partly nonlinear because I would maintain that Western literature, meaning European based literature, tends to be linear in fashion. And that, that was inherited by the Greeks and, and uh, earlier writers. It's not linear, it's sometimes not rational. And it's intendedly intended to be non-rational. And often it's contradictory within the same sutra, within the same uh, commentary. It'll seem like a, a person is making a point which defies logic, so to speak, at least defies a Western style logic. It may have an internal um, Asian logic, but it defies Western logic. Um, and here's the point I want to make with a, with a particular sentence. If one accepts it, it, meaning the literature, what it is, you become more comfortable with your unconscious intuitive nature. And that is one of the intentions of Buddhist literature. Now, we do have some things that are sort of manuals, and as a matter of fact, We've been discussing on the, on the Tuesday the tutorial, the Maka Shikan, which by its very nature is kind of manual, a manual of sitting meditation, Shikan, uh, Shamata and Vipassana, and the four types of, of Samadhi that one enters into. But it's also filled with a lot of, of explication of why certain things are done. But even in that work, which is sort of a manual, it many times defies the kind of Western logic that we seem to appreciate. And so we have to keep in mind also that Buddhist writings are not usually interpreted literally. Literalism is not one of the characteristics of Buddhist literature. Often the words point to an experience beyond words. So depending upon the type of literature that we talk about, they may be in couplets, they may be in a poetic form as well as, as prose. And often the writings are paradoxic and mystifying. And that's done, that's done intentionally. Are there any questions or comments before I go on at this point? And I should turn this way to look at these folks periodically. <laughs> That my left side is not as good as my right side. <laughs> and you, well, you circled back again to the very first thing you said about the literature. You walked away from it then to talk about manual, but you go back to expanding our minds beyond the rational or opening our minds. Right. That's right. Yeah. And and I think that I think that you see that whether you're dealing with something like the Platform Sutra, or you're dealing with the Heart Sutra, or you're dealing with. Um, Certainly, the, the sutra is dealing with the pure land. Uh, there's, you don't see the same rationality in those that you would find in other types of canonical works. Um, 
Any other any other thoughts or, or comments? Yes, Susan. Or I'm sorry, Linda. I was just going to make a comment that I noticed that we're just finishing um, the Lotus Sutra at at the California Tendai. We're doing uh -huh. the last chapter tomorrow night, and there's times that. And now I have a summation guide for that as well, besides the book. And there's times I didn't, it was so, um, so much like that, that fantastic kind of like all these different creatures and people and things going on. And I wasn't even sure sometimes, like by the time I finished a chapter, what it was trying to tell me, because was, there was so much of that, um, that seemed it almost crowded out with the real meaning of what they were trying to say. Uh, I, found, I found the Lotus Sutra really difficult that way to try to figure out, okay, what is this trying to tell me? Because there's so much going on in, in this chapter that you're trying to break down the, the fantastic from, you know, what, 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 is, what it actually is trying to tell you. Yeah, I, I, I sometimes say that the Lotus Sutra was written with Steven Spielberg in mind. <laughs> you know, I, I heard someone else call it kind of the Lord of the Rings version. <laughs> right, right. And, 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 you know. and, and that's and that's part of what I was getting at that, that it could be mystical, it can be farcical, etc. And and one of the reasons, by the way, and I'm I'm pretty sure that Junshin might have mentioned this, that one of the reasons that um, the Lotus Sutra is so popular is because if if you sit down and you read the Diamond Sutra by contrast. It is really a, a philosophical work that is fairly direct in terms of what it's trying to tell you. Although you may need to interpret and, and unpack some of what's being said, but it's relatively straightforward. It doesn't have the same sort of fantastic uh, notions that are embedded within it. On the other hand, because the Lotus Sutra has those, you know, a, a tens of thousands of beings who are there and some are playing you know musical instruments and and doing this and that it really captures the imagination for people to whom it's being read reading it is a different process than hearing it in the case of uh, especially in the case of lotus sutra i think uh so i imagine you know remember most well everybody here I would dare say is literate and can read. Um, that is a relatively recent phenomenon where you have the majority of the people being literate. And up until fairly recently, the only access that people would have to that literature is through someone who is literate reading it to them, whether it was a monk or uh, someone, someone along those lines. And so, one of the reasons the Lotus Sutra, as well as the Vimala Kirti Sutra that, that we just dis discussed periodically, uh, were so popular is because the visual imagery is so incredible. And here's the, a, a sort of a clue to dealing with some of those is when you are confronted by those, suspend your disbelief and allow your imagination to take over. Because sometimes that is where the, excuse me, sometimes that is where the message comes through, is when our imaginations are allowed to accept what's being heard and play with it. And, and that becomes really important. Did somebody else, I think somebody else had a hand up. Yes, Jake, and then, and then Brian. Yeah, one of the issues that I have, I feel as a as a Westerner, uh, reading some of the more, um, you know, um, passages that have a lot of imagery and stuff like that, is I feel like um, I have a little bit of um, resistance, maybe, because I remember all the times that I was in English class at school, and you would have the English teacher telling you, "Oh, this this passage represents this thing." And there was absolutely no way to prove or disprove what the English teacher was saying. You just kind of had to see, you just kind of had to go with it. Mm -hmm. And, and I feel like uh, for a lot of Westerners that might end up being an issue where there's that, I mean, it kind of goes back to this idea of having to suspend your, your logical uh, understanding of it. it. There's like a, a piece of you that feels like you shouldn't do that. 
that it's it's a bad thing to suspend the logical mind. Well, and 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 I think just something to to add to that is that, and that's why I started by saying that studying Buddhist literature is a different process compared to studying something for knowledge or instruction or something along those lines. And you know, we do it when we're reading a novel, for instance. You know, we we suspend our disbelief to to especially if it's a Marvel comic. Right. <laughs> or some of the graphic novels. And, and, and we, we do that and we and we revel in it. That's what makes it so interesting. Right. But we don't expect that to be true of a canonical work. Somehow we have the idea that a canonical work and I, and I think that <coughs> and, and here's a point that I want to make that I didn't put down because I, I realized somebody was going to say what you said, Jay, um, is that there's a distinct difference between how the literature is received in East Asia and how it's received outside of East Asia in the European based cultures in general. And so one of the things that is very useful is having a teacher to talk to you about, well, this is what this rep, this might represent, whatever it is. Um, but even then, I think that sometimes just allowing your, your imagination to open your mind and accept it for what it is, is really, is really important. There's a, and to give you an idea, by the way, and I would, I would talk about this in many of my, the Asian culture classes that I taught, is that in Western literature, it is a linear process. And you have expectations that one thing follows the next in a particular way. And you know, for instance, if you're watching a movie, two thirds through the movie, there's gonna be a crisis that has to be resolved. You know that's the format. Even if you hadn't been told that, you know that's the format. And, it, and I, I don't know that I've seen any movies that are uh, you know, European or American that don't follow that format as an example. Well, that doesn't happen in Asian literature. And so we're sort of stuck. We're not seeing what we expect to see based upon uh, the worldview that we've acquired. And that makes it a little bit, but that's one of the things that I find most fascinating about it. Because what a great way to break through our preconceived notions about things is to present something in a way that we don't anticipate. That, that really sort of shakes us a little bit instead of making us feel confident. Well, I know what's gonna happen next, you know. Um, it, Brian, you had, your, you had your hand up before. Yeah, I, I kind of fell along with Jake when I first read the, the Pure Land Sutras and about the 70 colors and all the sounds and all those things, I was resistant to it. But then I kind of read through it and somehow been going out living my life, it was kind of there in me and it was working on me. So I began to appreciate the greater variety in the world. And then when I would go back and reread it, I was less resistant to it. Uh -huh. it, 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 it it's, it's almost like they kind of work in tandem, like a feedback loop that you... you, you uh, it was, it kind of made me open to saying, hey, wait a minute, this is not, this world you inhabit is not so very different than this, what you think is totally fantastical world, silver lotus, but you, you know, all those sounds and colors. And it kind of, they kind of come to, came together for me somehow. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the, the next step after that, after accepting what you were just talking about, the visual and the oral and all that is, you know how many sutras and, and other works you'll find with a list of names, especially in the Lotus Sutra, there's name after name after name after name of, you know, golden aura of the beach, and, you know, names like that. One of the things to, to do is not, a, a, I, I pictured it initially when I first started reading sutra, Rather like those parts in the in the Hebrew Bible where 
so and so begat so and so who begat so and so who begat so and so, and you sort of read through those, you know, without really stopping and studying them in detail, unless you happen to be a scholar on the on the subject matter. And but I got to the point where I began looking at all of those Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and 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 others, and looking at the name as it's being translated into into English. But looking at the name and just imagining what is that name trying to convey to me? In other words, the names are not arbitrary. You know, the names are are there for a particular reason. And we may not be aware of what that reason is. But by stopping and taking the time to read them and visualizing and again, working with your imagination, it becomes, I, I think, even more even more useful you know that that's some, something you just think about in the future when you begin when you begin looking at those are there any more questions or comments before we move on no okay and and the next couple of points i want to make are points that we were just talking about uh some sutra paint fantastic pictures of magnificent transcend transcendent scenes that are not to be taken literally but to be savored for their symbolic effect. Let me repeat that. They are to be savored for this symbolic effect. Others tell a metaphorical story that helps evoke our associations and teach a lesson. And finally, in this section, often there are forms of the sutras take the form of a conversation between Shakyamuni Buddha and one of his disciples or heavenly bodhisattvas, someone along those lines, to provide a learning experience that makes that makes you feel like you are there. And to me, when I'm reading the, the sutra, and I have to say, this didn't happen 50 years ago when I first began reading sutra. This is something that occurred at, at a later period of time. To read that passage where Shariputra is asking a question and then Shakyamuni Buddha is responding to Shariputra's question. And be aware, by the way, that poor Shariputra is really the guy that is, is meant to look like you dummy. What a stupid question that is. Right? <laughs> I mean, that's the, and, and, and realizing that Shariputra is, Shakyamuni Buddha's chief disciple. And yet he gets called to task all the time. <laughs> oh, Shari Putra, you dummy. I mean, he doesn't say it quite that way, but that's what it sounds like, you dummy. Don't you realize? Da 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 da. You know, Mahamogliana and some others get much better, much better press. Poor Shari Putra. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's because Shari Putra died before Shakyamuni Buddha, so they could pick on him. I don't know. Uh, you know, he, he couldn't speak for himself. Maybe that was the reason for it. Um, but it's important to, when you read it, I, I think that we try to make, there's two parts to the reading of the sutra. And then I'm going to say something about, about reading in general of sutra. There's a couple of things about the reading of a sutra. Number one is you, while at one point you are reading canonical works, and we can talk about whether or not it's, with quotes, sacred, but it's canonical. But at the same time, because it is filled with symbolism, because it's filled with metaphor, because it's filled with simile, etc., we have to read it in that context, not to read it literally, but to read it with a sense of, I'll use the term awe, to read it with a sense of awe. And I think that sometimes we try to read sutra too much like an instruction manual. And when we do that, it loses its, it loses its magic, you know? And, and by the way, the method that I suggest to encounter sutra, and I, I didn't mention it in the handout, but I'll mention it now. First, you read the material 
as though you were reading straight through, like a novel. You know, you're reading it from beginning to end. You're not asking a lot of questions. You're trying to get it. Now, if you've got a work, let's say like the Lotus Sutra, which has 28 chapters, you want to do this chapter by chapter. You don't want to read the whole, or you could read the whole book. However, each of the chapters <clears throat> are grouped into segments and each of those segments stand alone. So chapter one doesn't necessarily inform you very much about chapter 14, by example. So reading the chapter through, uh, just reading it, you're not really asking any questions. You're, you're trying to see it as a roadmap. Where's it going? How's it going there? The next thing to do is actually to write it out. To, it's, that's, that's called shakyo, to actually write out the material. You write it out in English. The third section is to recite it out loud. The recitation and the reading are very different experiences. First you read it through, then you write it, then you recite it. Now you go back and you begin to treat it in a slightly different way by analyzing it, deconstructing it, examining it more thoroughly. But those are the methods that are, are considered the most fruitful for examining, for examining sutra. Um, there's such a difference to me at least, between reading the sutra and reciting the sutra so I hear it in my head. It's a very different experience. And it's very, it's very useful. Okay. Any other questions about that? I, I know that I know that Shoshin is sitting there, and I know that that's the method that the Shoshin uses. Um, did you want to make any comments about that? Since I know that's the method you use, Shoshin? You're muted. <laughs> I don't know about a, a comment, but I found like recently I just uh, read chapter by chapter through the Lotus Sutra. And, you know, I've done all these three steps that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, and, and every, and I think that's a great way to begin, but I also uh, got even more out of it when I then try to do my creative thing, which for me, the only thing is, you know, I try to write some kind of poetry. And just uh, after you've read through the ideas and then try to put them in, in your own words and get at the essence of what was in the chapter. Um, it's like, you don't know what you found out until you just kind of let everything go and create something else out of it and you know is it a, a you know a, an awe-inspiring thing every time no but um it's informative and sometimes it is awe-inspiring so maybe as a fourth step i might suggest whatever um i know you're talking primarily about reading but whatever people do for um, their own creative, you know, painting, writing, whatever, try something like that. It was, it was amazing for me. That's all. That's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Shoshin. Yes, Jake. So right at the beginning of when you started speaking again, um, you use the ter the phrase um, symbolic effect. And then you, st and then you were talking about awe inspiring. So I'm kind of wondering when we when somebody reads a sutra uh should they maybe be focused more on how they feel about the sutra whether that happens to be a sense of awe or whether that's a sense of let's say aversion or something like that and then work through those feelings well i i no, i think that's a really good a really good point and what i would like to to comment about that is that i made mention earlier that the intention of sutra is also to provide a different perspective. And 
part of that perspective is to get underneath the thinking brain and to go to that which is, we'll, we'll call it intuitive for lack of a better term, that which is intuitive. Because that's where the symbolism really has an effect. It, it gets underneath, because as we know, reading the sutra, I think is vital. And as a, as a, as a Tendai practitioner, um, we refer to the practice as both scholarship and then the other practices, things like um, Shodo or Shokyo or, or whatever it might be. And the most effective sutra are those that will shake you up enough so that your intellect doesn't really get it. But what's happening in here, and I'm pointing to my heart, mind, spirit, is going to get it. And that, that's, really, that's really important. Um, any other thoughts or questions? It's really difficult to go like this. I feel like I'm in a ping pong match here. It's like, <clears throat> yes, Jay, uh, uh, excuse me, Joe. Yeah, it seems to me that there are three levels of meaning or uh, a message or content in the sutra. Uh, uh, so I understand the way in which you are describing the Western approach, so to speak, and the Eastern approach in the sense that the East, in the Western approach, you tend to focus on the propositions in the text. So you try to reduce the content of the text to the set of propositions, whereas in the East, what you're trying to get is the way of thinking or cognitive breakthrough, cognitive breakthrough. Yes. Uh, so it's, it's uh, transformative. The whole experience of reading the text is transformative. And in a way, the real content of the text is not in the text. It's what you begin to see in your real life after you're reading the text. You, you begin to notice things that you have never thought about or paid attention to. So, so in, in the Eastern way, I, I think that's what you meant by smashing right? um, uh, yes. delu delusion. In a way, you achieve a cognitive breakthrough. Uh, right? but, but it seems to me that there is a third layer, uh, which is that th the sheer sound of the sutra influences your being. So for some, for, so for in Japan, even you don't understand the meaning of the Lotus Sutra, uh, Heart Sutra, you recite it, you recite it because it does something to yourself. So, so I, I see three layers here, propositional, cognitive, and the uh, sensual. <laughs> Thank you. That, that's, those, are, those are really good points. Those are really good points. And, and you know, I, I, I kid people about it quite a bit, but when you're, when in some ways, when we recite the Heart Sutra, as, just as an example, when we recite the Heart Sutra, Avalokitsavada Bodhisattva doing the Prajna Paramita clearly saw emptiness of all five conditions. We can't help but imagine, think, get into what is being done. When you're doing it in, in Japanese, and by the way, if a person is reciting the Heart Sutra in Japanese, they're not hearing the Japanese equivalent of Avalaki Shavara Bodhisattva doing deep Prajna Paramita. They're hearing Kanji Zaibo Zatsukyojin Hanya Haramita. It's the recitation which is resonating within the mind and within the heart and within the spirit, the, the, the Kokoro, that one that the Heart Sutra is really responding to. And most people, I don't think, and you could correct me, or maybe uh, Schumann could correct me. Most people who are reciting the Heart Sutra never think about what it's actually saying. That, that's really a, a very little import. I don't know. Do you? How do you feel about that, Tsumami? Someone who can recite you know, without reading it and just <clears throat> probably their interest in the Buddhism, so they have studied at least mm. have some understanding. But if somebody is just reading together and then, you know, relatively new to the Buddhism, most of the time is kind of to Japanese Buddhist terminology is so foreign, like it, 
and need explanation to it. Yeah. So by sound, open is just a sound. Yeah. 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 And I, and I and I think I think that's true. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay. So I wanted to provide two examples of one is a sutra and one is a commentary, and I should be moving along a little bit quicker here. Um, and the first are the Prajnaparamita Sutras, uh, the Diamond Sutra and the Heart Sutra. And I'll just hit some of the major points. Um, to begin with, as everyone knows, the Diamond Sutra is widely studied as influential in the Zen schools. And I just want to read a couple of things about this. The reader who follows the discussion carefully will undergo a change of perspective, the alteration of consciousness. The Diamond Sutra cuts through many illusions people have about the solid, permanent, real nature of the world. And when illusion is cut away, what remains is perfect wisdom. The Diamond Sutra, as in other sutra in the Prajnaparamita, collection explains that perfect wisdom cannot be stated or distinguished or learned. You can't reflect on it with your usual sensing or thinking. And if we approach the Diamond Sutra, and we, we as, a, as a Sangha have had a long discussion on the Diamond Sutra. We spent, I don't know how long did we spend, a couple of years discussing the Diamond Sutra. Um, that discussion was intended to understand critically, analytically, what the sutra was saying, but only so that when you actually now sit down and read it, you can let go of that analysis and that critique and read it for what it is, which is intended to say I'm describing something that words cannot reveal. That's what the sutra is doing. And that's, in, in a way, what we do when we listen to certain kinds of music or certain kinds of poetry or watch certain kinds of dance. We're being exposed to something that words themselves can't necessarily convey. Of the Heart Sutra, which is the most widely recited sutra in East Asia, it succinctly states the fundamental ideas of the Prajnaparamita. It points out that form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Absolute reality is not dependent on anything else. It is calm, undifferentiated, without any form. And yet, as it appears in the moment-to-moment -moment world of our experience, form is undifferentiated, individual, and existing. <clears throat> And I especially want to point out this next two points of, of the Heart Sutra. The realization of shunyata emptiness on a deep level is perfect wisdom. But shunyata is only part of the understanding. The sutra points out the other side of emptiness, that each thing seems to have some unique form on a relative label, level. To utterly understand form as emptiness and emptiness as form, you must make a leap. Here we again, I say a leap of consciousness. You're going from this analytic mind to the mind which is unformed. A leap of consciousness when you can recognize both sides and not incidentally the middle way, you will achieve perfect wisdom. In other words, the very nature sounds contradictory. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Uh, somebody wants to get in. Um, so it's important to recognize that what you're trying to do is you're trying to change the notion of what it is you think you understand by a change of consciousness. You can't do it through the analysis. Since form is another side of emptiness, Tendai Buddhism discourages people from withdrawing from the world in the blankness of emptiness. Instead, you can and should live in an awakened life by being engaged and involved. Nirvana is not separate from samsara, everyday life. 
when you have the right mental approaches to perfect wisdom, your everyday life is transformed to become truly awakening. That's not something that we do through analysis. That's something that we do by allowing, the, in this case, the Heart Sutra to break through to the Kokoro, the heart, mind, spirit that's within us. Good evening, Ichishima Sensei, or good morning to you. Ohayo gozaimasu. It's good to see you. Glad you could join us. Even we got it. We got about ten minutes left. So, <laughs> and finally, I wanted to look at Nagarjuna's Twelve Gate Treatise, uh, which I've been going through again more recently. And I have to say that I don't know how many times I've read it before the Twelve Gate Gate Thesis Treatise, but it at, for whatever reason, maybe it's because I'm older. I haven't read it probably in the last decade. So it could be that I'm older, it could be that uh, other things have happened, but it's having a very different effect on me now reading it. Um, in this case, Nagarjuna states that we know things that, that we know things in the world by their nature, characteristics, and the function. And then he goes out of his way, and I won't read the whole thing. He goes out of his way to say that nothing exists outside of circumstances. That, in fact, nature is based upon circumstances and function is based upon circumstances. Everything is based upon circumstances. And he explains that all things, he also explains that although all things are devoid of nature and non-existence, this is not the same as non-being. Whoa! smash my idea of what I think might be non-existence. It's not the same as non-being. He's saying that non-being is true and being is false. He's not saying that. Emptiness is neither being nor non-being. A right view is not a view itself, but merely an absence of views. And I have to say, like, like I was saying a few moments ago, I hadn't read it in probably a decade. And it's short. It's not, a, it's not a very long, long piece. It's a relatively short treatise. But it really attempts to grab you and shake you up and say, stop that. You're thinking, you're trying to think rationally about non-rational things. And I think that that's an important point that we have to make. We sometimes say, well, I'm a rational being. Well, I got news for you. We're not rational beings. We're not thinking beings. We're feeling beings. We're feeling beings who try to think. That's the difference. And I think that too often we try to be rational uh, as a formula for feeling somehow that that's the way the world is. No, the world is not by itself rational. I think Hashem is getting pissed at my comments here, by the way, from the, from the thunder that's coming through here. Um, the other aspect is the Buddhist literature, and I'm going to finish with this. Buddhist literature is a portal to practice. And that is to say that correct study leads naturally to meditation and other practices. And the Zen school, by contrast, would say, or has said, I'm not sure how far it takes some of that. The Zen schools would argue that just sitting, well, especially Dogen would argue that just sitting is what one needs to do. That one should not depend upon sutra, etc. cetera. Tiantai and Tendai would argue, no, you need both those practices such as meditation, shakyo, whatever, but you also need study. And I have to say that the study provides the stuff that your mind works with 
when you're sitting meditation or doing other practices. And that's one of the reasons it's important. Um, and the final thing that I say is that by smashing delusion, one is awakening to the nature of reality. I'm going to leave it there. Ask if there's any other questions or comments. That's an invitation. Questions or comments? <laughs> Did I smash through delusion and there are no reasons for questions and comments? That would be pretty amazing. I think it's one thing to say a word like smash through delusion, but that doesn't mean my mind is going to perceive the world. All delusions are going to be smashed because, you know, I heard that I heard the truth from Lenny Bruce and all my health won't buy me well all my wealth won't buy me health you know it's just like yeah you hear it and you hear it enough it starts to make sense but but I think you know just just to hear the truth you, you can't change you can't your your heart and mind does not uh, no let, let's let's not confuse truth with reality <laughs> <laughs> Each of us has a separate truth, but there's only one reality. So let's not let's not conflate those. You know. What about other people? Are there any questions? Yes, Joe. Well, it's not so much question, but uh, uh, observation or comment. Uh, I was uh, thinking about Saicho okay, uh, as we were talking about making cognitive breakthrough. Uh -huh. so, so he, at the age of 21 or 20, I, I don't remember it, whether 21 or 22, he decided to stay at Mount Hiei for 12 years. Uh, so, so he okay. understood that this is not easy. So until he will be able to see truly what, understand what he is seeing, and until he truly embodies the, the wisdom of the Buddha, he will not come down. He really understood that it's not easy and it takes 12 years. But so, so, so that's something that I have been thinking about for some reason. And, and yet at the same time, his goal was not to attain the wisdom, but that was the beginning. Right? Once he attained that wisdom, he wanted to serve all sentient beings. So I think it is important to keep in mind those two aspects. We talk about cognitive breakthrough, but it is important to be reminded that this is not easy. E easy in, in the sense of until it really becomes part of your, your being. And, and also, I think it is also important to be reminded that that is not the goal, but that is that is a beginning for Saicho. Yeah, I I think those are all good points, Joe. I agree with you. Yeah. Any other any other thoughts? Well, may I? Yes, please, Sensei. Yeah, uh, Professor Joe mentioned that twelve years uh, secured the drive that uh, Saicho, founder of Tendai, decided. And 12 years, it's very meaningful. Uh, you know, Asanga, uh, he is a pioneering uh, scholar and uh, Buddhist priest of uh, Yongachara in India. Uh, he was seeking truth uh, for 12 years totally. But the first uh, three years, he stayed in a cave just meditating, but he uh, the, he did couldn't understand what is the true meaning of the reality. But uh, he found, you know, several uh, phenomena that uh, uh, Sparrow came into the cave during his meditation, and uh, by ju just touching very uh, soft feather touch to the uh, rock of the cave. Uh, finally, uh, they made uh, such a uh, nest, and uh, he was so surprised. Oh, my patience of sitting is not enough, and so he 
continued another three years. Then he found another uh, phenomena. For instance, uh, uh, water drops to the, uh, what shall I say, a rock on the <coughs> sitting place. But finally, even uh, such as uh, dropping uh, water from the ceiling makes a hole of the uh, pool of the water. Oh, this is amazing. And so he continues uh, the another three years. And so like this, you know, but he, after 12 years, he couldn't find anything. And so he gave up the seeing meditation and when he wanted to, he, uh, to get out of the cave, he noticed, uh, you know, the uh, wounded dog, and uh, he really showed his compassion. Oh, oh my goodness! Uh, you know, the uh, dog wounded, and uh, but he found also some uh, mushy, uh, some you know, uh, very small I insect worms. Yeah. So uh, uh, he thought if uh, he kills such a worms uh, also that is not compassion. And so, so he just closed his eyes. He tried to uh, leave a small insect out of his wounded part of the body. Then as soon as he touches his uh, teeth to the worms, then, <laughs> you know, that the wounded dog turned out to be a, a mitria. And, uh, oh, I wanted to see you for a long, long time. Why didn't you appear during my meditation? Then he said, I was here from the very beginning, but he, you ignored me and entered into the cave just for sitting. And so he realized that compassion is so important. Uh, that kind of things is very much in 12 years, you know, uh, that is uh, when I was uh, reading that uh, point uh, from Tibetan history of Buddhism by Putin, I found that such a wonderful explanation. So uh, 12 years really has meaning for, thank you. Thank you, Sensei, for that, for that wonderful story. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna ask the other people to get ready to go out to the Hondo now. And please don't talk to each other on the way because I'm doing a Dharma talk. Well, let, me, let me begin. And this was something that I've been thinking about uh, recently because it's, it's from the news. Within a few weeks after 9-11, 2001, the United States and allies from NATO invaded Afghanistan as a retaliation for Osama bin Laden's use of that country as a training and staging area for the attacks on the Twin Towers in New York City, the Pentagon, the Capitol in Washington. And I remember that date distinctly and the conflicted feelings I had about the US staging a war in that part of the world. Like many of us, I thought about how Afghanistan had been a charnel ground for armies going back to Alexander the Great around 300 BCE. Persians, Greeks, Mongols, the British, Soviets, and now the Americans were on their way to attempt to occupy a country that defies occupation. There were very few protests in the United States regarding the American invasion of, of Afghanistan, unlike the invasion of Iraq a few years later. Somehow, many people felt that the invasion was justified because of the presence of Al Qaeda and their Taliban enablers. I was conflicted because on one hand, I had a visceral desire to bring to justice those people who had killed almost 3000 people in the Twin Towers and thousands others who died as a result of cancer and, and other illnesses attained at that time. Simultaneously, I felt that waging war against Afghanistan would bring about many thousands more deaths, many of whom would be mm. civilians mm. that had no part in, mm. in that. 
to me, I could see karma written all over the narrative. Americans were willfully ignorant of the role of the United States in supporting and promoting Taliban activities that resulted in their takeover. Taliban occupied 90% of Afghanistan, and that was being supported by American military uh, gifts to the, to the Taliban, as well as uh, not only material, but, but other materials. During the Afghani civil war, we have to remember that was a civil war that the Soviets were introducing themselves into. And the Taliban were just convenient surrogates for the Soviets from an American perspective. The US is now in the process of leaving Afghanistan after almost 20 years. One of the things I find really curious about this is that we have a coalition of those on the progressive left and those on the reactionary right who feel that American forces should remain in Afghanistan. About somewhere between 66 to 73% of the American population feel that withdrawal is really the, the proper course. Now, I think that the Americans who feel that way recognize a pragmatic, a pragmatic realization of diminished returns to a continued occupation. I mentioned earlier that I could see karma written all over the narrative of the US invading Afghanistan. And it reminds me when Shakyamuni Buddha was asked to come to a battlefield to mediate between two parties at war. One of those parties was his own home oligarchic republic, the capital of um, Vapalavatu, and the other was Magadha. It was evident that Magadha had a larger, more powerful army and would massacre many people and annex Kapilavatu. He did as he was asked. He showed up, literally, we're told that he stood between the two armies on the battlefield and worked out an agreement. And the two parties both went home for a time. Later, they returned and pursued the battle. Right. This time, the Buddha failed to stop the battle when asked, and he's reported to have indicated that these parties had to work out their own karma. Now, this is not to suggest that karma implies inevitability. It's not. It is to say that the actions we do now or have done in the past have consequences now and in the future. It also speaks to what I refer to as collective karma. The United States was founded engaging in slavery and as a nation benefited from the cruel original sin of slavery. And who benefited were white Europeans who, do who were dominant. Now, 400, 400 years plus later, we have a reckoning that is collective karma. There are many who resist it. We see it all the time. And there are some of us who are allies to the former slaves, the black people in America. And now we're dealing with Asian racism. We're dealing with Latinx racism, et cetera, et cetera. If we as a people, as humanity, believe something must be done, regarding the environmental crisis, but do not act directly to stem our unwholesome desires that rape the earth, then it is karma that we as a people, as humanity, will suffer the consequences. Collective karma. Afghanistan, racism, the environment, the list is long of actions and by inference, inactions that constitute our karma. The good news is that karma is not inevitability. The reality is that we must have the character, the discipline, and the will to change the course for our collective previous actions and inactions that have set into motion. 
we must ask ourselves, do we have the character? Do we have the discipline and the will to do what needs to be done now? Not in the future, right now. This is right action, right effort, right speech, right livelihood from the noble eightfold path. This is the Buddhist path. Svaha.